Welcome to the EV Cafe podcast. This is a series of sessions with innovators, collaborators, and pioneers of our industry. And this session is no different. We've got Kevin Booker, Sam Clark, and Richard Parker. It's a triple whammy. We're usually joined by another member of the EV Cafe crew. And while Sam Clark is right there, today I get to hog them all and host you. What an absolute pleasure to have you here. Hi. Hi. Hello. Where are you? This is a beautiful office. I'm down one end and you're down the other end. Where are we, Richard? We are at Bridgestone uh, UK's head office. Um, very, really pleased to host you here. Um, and obviously we'll be back here in um, at the end of this month. I know we're recording this in September, but in a couple of weeks for our partner day for the EV Cafe as well. So, you know, we're really looking forward to all the work that we do with you guys on this, the last half of this year. Absolutely. Ryan and Webfleet are a very valued partner of the EV Cafe. So it's our absolute pleasure to host you today. And this is a very special day because I know that you are about to receive the BDI of those who are watching rather than just listening. We'll spot behind me a framed certificate. Now, Sam, what does that certificate say? Well, uh, yeah, visually, I can't read it, but I think I'm pretty sure what it says. And that is that it's the uh, greatest journey. Um, ever done in an electric car on a single charge. Um, and that is something we achieved, as you know, this summer, um, ably assisted by the man on my right and the man on my left um, to achieve that and, uh, and break, the, break the record. Well, quite right. And Kevin, that's not the only record that's been broken by you guys, right? Uh, yeah, we also have the uh, van record, which is the longest distance to single charge in an electric van. Absolutely crazy. I can't believe that you've done this again. So just, just to reiterate that, there's two Guinness World Records here, the longest journey by EV in one charge and the greatest distance travelled by an electric van. And both are no mean feat. To you as, as a massive team that was involved, but with you two as the drivers, Kevin and Sam, there was so much energy required from you. This is a true feat of what I would call endurance. How many hours were you going at for this record? Um, it was about... Uh... Just under 24 hours of driving around uh, rural Norwich, basically. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it, it wasn't just the driving either. You know, the uh, it wasn't that one of us was having a kip in the back while the other one was driving either. You know, it was complete and constant concentration on both the driver and the navigator because the route's obviously very important and we needed to make sure that we were going in the right direction. We weren't going over the same roads twice. Um, so, um, you know, we're using the, using the kit that was kindly provided by by Webfleet, we were able to generate routes that enabled us to be able to hit waypoints all the way through and make sure that we were always on track and make, to ensure we didn't make take uh, too many wrong turns. So, um, yeah, a lot of concentration for 24 hours and the driving was just part of it. The navigation was just as tricky. Mm. Now, and if anybody who is watching, please, please, please do look for this. The whole thing was captured by Generate Media, uh, who do sort of collaborative content. And there's a wonderful sort of 10 minute video that really summarizes this. And, and Richard, you were fundamental to this. There was a whole group of us behind the scenes um, sort of supporting Sam and Kevin as they went. But you were there. You were there making sure that things were working well, keeping an eye on the data. So tell us about this then. Webfleet's telematics. How did Webfleet help to break both of those records? Just not just the technological advancement, but the team. How did you do this? Um, oh, there's a number of different areas. I mean, we started as to, to, to Sam's point, you know, before we even got in the car, was was actually was the vehicle going to give the data in sufficient quality, you know, that would substantiate a Guinness World Record? Because their criteria for success is, as you can imagine, incredibly rigorous. So we had to be absolutely sure that we were going to get it. Um, so there's a lot of planning that went into making sure the vehicle, the Mustang Mackie, in this case, was actually going to give us everything that we needed to do it. Um, and then, as Sam said, you know, with the planning. You know, looking at Sam did enormous amount of work, you know, on some basic apps and looking at it. But then it was like, OK, how do we turn this into a, a no fault exercise in, or as little risk of fault as we go around it? Because stopping, you know, and not carrying momentum through corners because we made an error was clearly going to be in this, you know, in, in the margins that we had for success, every wrong turn would have amounted to loss of range of something and merely potentially failure. So that was in that bit. And then, and then finally, as we were going through the event, the fact that we can capture exactly what's going on with that vehicle from a state of charge perspective for the live odometer readings, you know, 
I'm sure Sam will talk about it later, but but we really were down to yards of success and getting over the line. So to have that like that in the moment update about where we were enabled us at one point to replan the end of the route to try and get success, you know, so that we're removing as much of the ambiguity as we could do. Yeah, and you're very modest there because I happen to know from being one of the sort of behind the scenes support crew that you were there using the flexible platform to see if this route could be optimised. And, you, you, you know, that mapping bit on the sort of dumb apps and tools, that's something that Kevin, Sam and I were all involved in for a few weeks before we submitted it to you guys. And that's a really good example of how normal people can only go so far without a partner like Webfleet. It, it may not have even, even happened. And actually, Kevin, coming to you about the vehicle. So the Mustang Mac e it's not, it's not a stranger to you, is it, that vehicle? So actually, I have uh, three other Guinness World records in the Mustang Mark e So uh, the John O'Groves to Land's End one, the charging time one, and the least number of charge stops. So actually, the Mac e kind of gave us that combination of a big enough battery and being efficient enough to get that distance, because there are cars with bigger batteries, but the Mackey had that balance of being able to roll quite nicely and being quite efficient with the speeds we were doing. No, I love it. I love that you've got five records. I just think that's completely crazy. I've long may it continue. And Sam, you were integral in sort of helping to decide which vehicle you were going to use. Now, we, we obviously mustn't name the ones that you ruled out, but thinking about the Mackey specifically, for me, I think having listened to you talk about this challenge, a lot of it's to do with the art of the possible, pushing boundaries. That's a, that's a family car, right? What was the point in your eyes of this exercise? Well, I think between <clears throat> excuse me between both Kev and I, we we've assessed different vehicles because, as you said, you know it's not always about the size of the battery. And indeed, the, the van record we did last year was was achieved in a in a vehicle with half the battery of the existing record that we broke. Um, so it's not just about the battery size, it's about efficiency, um, it's about drivetrain. There's certain vehicles that we tested which cruised extremely well on motorways but weren't as good at slower speeds. So um, the one thing that Mackie had in its favour is it, is it cruised extremely well or it, it rolling resistance was, was really good in this particular environment whereby we wanted to do reasonably low speeds in, on the flat and it just it just enjoyed doing that sort of um uh, the sort of driving um, and so the combination of that efficiency the battery size uh, and all the other components we were able to put you know the right tires on the right wheel sizes and all those sort of variables that meant that we could you know there is no perfect car for this I suppose because they're, they're all designed slightly differently and they've all got different component parts that that build it into what it is uh, but in this particular day on this particular time you know that was the vehicle that we felt was the best for the job and um, and it did the job that we expected it to do and a little bit more thankfully mm -hmm. it, it's an absolute match made in heaven you've got the web fleet telematics planning the most efficient route combined with local knowledge and experience that we've all contributed to this challenge but that monitoring of the real-time energy consumption and driving performance kind of brings me on to my next question whilst you've got the web fleet data that's so reliable it's completely accepted by guinness world records for being crucial to breaking these records you can't do it without that measurement i want to know a bit more about this driving behavior because of course i drive like i stole most of my electric vehicles and so my <laughs> my consumption is terrible however choosing this team you sam and you kevin as the drivers this is all about maximizing that vehicle range now kevin you are the king of the kilowatt consumption i, I think so let's go to you first how do you, in that moment, that 24 hours, stay focused and make sure you're not being too heavy footed? And it's, as you say, it's about being really gentle on the throttle. I mean, the one thing that people don't know is it's about reading the road ahead. So you're looking where the corners are coming up. And then, you know, if there's a slight downhill gradient, you're taking advantage of that. And it's all about reading the terrain and just all those things and doing really tiny throttle adjustments to not be too heavy footed and the other thing is not to the aim is not to use the real physical brakes if you're slowing down you just need to keep it on regen alone so then you get an energy back rather than waste it as heat and that's i like this because this is sort of the average joe could take some tips from what you've demonstrated here and actually sam you and i both have electric motorbikes we get quite different results data results out of our bike ranges how did you apply what you learned on you know, the EV rally, perhaps, onto this record? Well, I think for me, because um, you know, Kevy is the king of efficiency driving and has been doing it a long time. Um, you know, I've been driving EVs for nearly 20 years. And part of the learning of how to do this in an efficient way is that in the very early days of EVs, it was, you know, the ranges were, you know, my, my first motorbike or scooter was 
14 to 20 mile range. Um, and the only way to, to get across London and back again in those days was to be as efficient as humanly possible. And so I learned very quickly that the battery gauge was a needle, which wasn't really a gauge, it was a voltmeter. So every time you accelerated, it dipped low. And if it touched the red bar at the bottom, the motor would cut out. So I've quickly learned that if I, if I feathered the throttle gently, so that needle didn't go down too far, and I was mm. just driving as smoothly as possible, as Kev said, without using the brakes too much, no, no jerkiness. Um, then I could keep that needle off the red and therefore the motor didn't cut out. You know, And it's the same principle today in that that smooth r- driving or riding is, is what it's all about. And then there's other variables, as you just alluded to, Sass, with your, you know, we both got the same motorbike pretty much, but your efficiency is better because you're four stone lighter than me and therefore that makes a difference. Um, so there's lots of different um, parameters that we've got to consider in all of this um, to get to, to eke out those, those little benefits that you know, make a big difference at the end. Now, I'm in a privileged position, actually, because of the EV Rally. I get to host that with the wonderful John Curtis and Webfleet. You guys were there. And I think, listening to the other EV Cafe podcast that Webfleet were on with James Dewhurst, Richard, did you say that the average kilowatt hour consumption for all the vehicles, which range from the motorbike that we just discussed through the cars and the vans up to the EHGV, did it come out at 3.4? What was the figure? Can you remember? Uh, I don't think we discussed the average for everyone. We were discussing the van on the podcast, uh, particularly because myself and uh, Stephen um, wanted to do some real world testing of like what a, what a commercial vehicle can achieve. Brilliant, Ooh. and that and that that came out, and that was carrying two hundred kgs. That came out averaging at three point four, which was I just think is, is amazing, which was for fourteen hundred miles, and. Uh, we weren't doing it at going this world record speeds. We were driving it to the speed limits of the road in which a normal driver would do. Um, but but just picking up on that driver behaviour, you know, the, what we've done with this, plus we've also had a customer work really close to with us who's got a quite a decent sized fleet, and they've improved their range of their vehicles by seventeen percent. Now. You know, that from an operational fleet perspective is enormous in terms of the effectiveness and the productivity that can be got. And actually, these two things have led us down a route about actually how do we support drivers? They're never going to be Guinness World Record holders, but the impact of their behaviours to the product- productivity of that organisation, I mean, Sam will know from, from his you know business that he ran, a lot of our fleets are service fleets. They are last mile delivery fleets. You know, these rely on these vehicles being assured of getting the job done each day. So we're, we're looking very much at how do we support drivers directly in the vehicle with the right level of coaching in terms of maximizing range. Because I've been doing some testing in mine and some of the figures in reality can be really quite stark. You're talking acceleration, 10% of range disappeared and using regen effectively, looking at 20 to 30% of, of, of range being eroded as well. So Combining that together is, is huge. So that's really our focus off the back of this event and, and the rallies of recent years is like how to be support drivers getting better performance. Yeah, I just think that regen point's a good one as well. I mean, there's some people that will be listening to this while they're driving along right now and some, maybe even a few people in their electric vehicles thinking, well, I'm driving along right now listening to this and how can I be, how can I be better? And we talked about the smoothness and trying to trying to not scrub speed too much. You know, regen is an important aspect of electric vehicles, but it's not always the best thing to use, right? So in certain contexts, regenerative braking yeah. is really useful because it helps slow the car down using the motor rather than the brakes to do that. But on motorways, it's it's less effective. So if you've got high regen on, on a motorway, then you're always fighting the throttle even if or, or the accelerating pedal mm. without knowing it. So you're, you're almost constantly going back and forth. And even mm. if it's only so slight you can't even tell, you're constantly fighting the motor and then actually going forwards and back, forwards and back for all the time. Whereas if you have the regen on the lightest setting when you're traveling at higher speeds, mm. then you'll cruise more effectively and yeah. you'll get more range out yeah. of it. So there's useful things we can we can get out of what we've done on yeah. the record, which manifests itself directly into what people do on their day-to-day yeah. driving. For, for the average driver who potentially is given a commercial, an, e, uh, an ELCV, they may just be handed the keys, mm. you know, and they don't get necessarily the right level of education that goes along with that new technology they're now in charge of. So that's why it's in actually if you can get straight to the driver and not rely on management or, or fleet managers to deliver it, you stand a better chance potentially of actually getting the performance you expect out of that vehicle. So, 
well, expect and better. You know, I've spent my entire career measuring things and trying to get good commerciality out of things. And all I'm hearing is if that was, did you say 17% with that van? I mean, that's a huge saving. Yeah, 17%. Now, this particular van, Sarah, I won't name it just for the sake of it at the moment, but it actually presents you with a range um, at the beginning of the day that, that's predicated on the performance of the vehicle in the past. So, so we, we, he actually showed me two same vehicles, same location, charged to 100%. One presented 174 miles range, the other 124. Now, for a driver and, or a multi-driver vehicle, which these are, that any driver can get in the, in the day, actually getting in and seeing that you've got a manifest for the day that says you need 150 miles, but the, the vehicle's presenting you 124 miles of range when you get in, creates feelings of anxiety, which is what all the things we've all tried to get rid of in terms of our discussions around range anxiety and things like that. So again, this intervention piece around giving the driver the knowledge through the planning system and then delivery of what's going to happen in an order and say you are going to get to the end because your driving efficiency is telling us you're getting it can help to manage some of the things that perhaps the dashboard is presenting um, that it wouldn't do otherwise. Mm. Well, it seems to lead to much better planning then. If you're a fleet manager, and you know, I, I do always love to listen to SJ Mitchell from OVO. She speaks wonderful knowledge that she's gained herself from her own experience in managing that fleet, right? And she talks a lot about if you can improve the use of, of a vehicle and get more from that asset, sweat that asset better, but whilst at the same time making that driver's life a better experience, take away that anxiety. And that's what Webfleet, I think, do really well. Yeah, and SJ's, you know, she's crucial to what we do as well. She's a great source. And, you know, at the end of the day, we sit on our side of the fence. We're not the fleet operator. We don't deal with the challenges of the fleet operator day to day. So being willing to absorb that information and learn from those, you know, those that we're lucky enough to work with is a massive feeder for us getting the right things out the other end to help them. Yeah, and planning, 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 planning. I know, Kevin, you spent a lot of time planning this with Sam and the whole team. There's a very active WhatsApp chat, <laughs> which I'm sure all of us have looked at through our fingers before thinking, God, what's happened now? But you were integral to planning this. And on the day you swapped, describe to us what it was like being in that vehicle, because I believe one of you had to be navigating whilst the other one was driving, essentially. Tell us what that was like, please. Um, it was quite a challenge. I mean, driving, uh, the driving bit, I'm Right, fine with. Um, navigation, on the other hand, is <laughs> not particularly strong point. And I mean, some of the stuff we did with the navigation before is because we did, some, did it with more basic things, we did have to change it on the fly, which was interesting when you know one of the routes was like, oh, that looks like a cycle lane. We probably shouldn't go down there. So, and then trying to follow that. And I'm not the greatest in maths, but you know, that was probably, for me, I found the driving the easy bit. The navigation is the really difficult bit for me. Yes, a, li a little bird told me, Sam Clark, that you were absolutely terrible at the navigation, but that's fine because you were so brilliant at the, at the driving. And speaking of birds, what happened on that amazing piece of dash cam footage, Sam Clark? <laughs> oh, yes, um, I think I, we think I nearly ran over a peacock, but it, it's um, it's quite difficult to tell with the frame rate whether or not it was a, as a silhouette of a peacock. But it seems like an odd thing to be on the side of the road. It was three o'clock in the morning, I think. Um, but yeah, we, we had a few obstacles along the way, including fallen trees, uh, various mm. animals. We saw some incredible wildlife, actually, mm. you know, very early in the morning and owls and rats and foxes and all sorts of weird and wonderful creatures. But yeah, we'll never, I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of whether that was actually a peacock or not. But um, no, it, was, it was it was an experience nonetheless. Mm. On, on ornithologists unite i think if you do watch that video and please do go and find it we'll probably add the link to the end of this so uh, because it is comedy it's a great video but i don't i don't think it was because i think it's a kind of marsh harrier you're in this amazing environment but what gets me sam what, I, what always strikes me about you is your mindset this ability to just deliver on a task and understand what's required of you and and, res and be responsive but when you're that tired how do you manage it how does it work with the two of you swapping over um, well, we both were able to get a bit of a break um, for a couple of hours each, I think, during the 24-hour stint. Um, and, and Richard was amazing in, in jumping in the passenger seat and supporting us while we, while one of us had a bit of a break. It's obviously a, a real mental, a mental game, right? Um, and we've got mm. to try and concentrate as much as we can uh, and just keep pushing forward. And, and it, it does, you know, we're starting very early. We started at two o'clock in the morning, I think, half past two, something like that. So, you know, straight away, it's, you know, bleary-eyed before we start. 
Um, very cold, actually, that time in the morning as well. And I'm going through the whole the whole cycle of the day. Um, so, yeah, concentration is a major thing, you know, and, and luckily, you know, Kevin and I have got a pretty, you know, between us a tremendous amount of experience in how to drive, but also how to concentrate is is equally as important. And, and our, you know, and our ability to communicate with each other and not fall out and all those sort of things, because you're in the same space for a long time together, going over the same sort of conversations in regards to how we're trying to do this record and think, you know, trying to interpret everything as we go. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of factors involved, a lot of planning involved. Of course, we talked about that. Uh, but on the day, yes, it, it was a real a real mental slog. And I think we were talking about this before we started recording. Mm. You know, it was about 24 hours after we'd finished, we all just crashed. You know, the brain finally just went, oh, my God, I'm exhausted. Mm. Um, so we were okay during the adrenaline keeps you going. But but afterwards, all of a sudden, it's a bit of a green fleet rally is this, in a yeah. similar way. You know, you, you do something and you're busy and you're flying around for a week. And then all of a sudden, you just... Oh God, I'm exhausted. Uh, but it typically happens, you know, afterwards. You know, after quite a, sometimes quite a long time after the event, where your body just goes. Whoa. So yeah, yeah we, we managed to get it done. It was about it was about half past seven at night, wasn't it, when we pulled in to the supermarket to do the final swap over. Yeah. And at that point, Sass, the the jeopardy was already there. Yeah. You know, so actually, for the last sort of six or seven hours, you were you weren't tired because you were. We, the activity of the brain and across all aspects of changing the route, you know, going down roads because uh, towards the last few hours, we were even off routes that yeah. we hadn't even planned. You know, it yeah. was just, it, it was, it was ridiculous really. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that kept you very much awake and alive. <laughs> yeah. Cause it was actually some of the bits near the end when the car was saying no miles remaining, we still had to be on it so much. Cause actually we almost passed the road sign which meant the AA would have been, wouldn't have been able to recover us because it was a sign that was actually... Mm. So we're still so focused that much to notice a road sign to say, oh, that can't support the weight of the, the truck that's going to recover us. So yeah. we last minute changed route just based on seeing that sign. So it's just the yeah. adrenaline's really yeah. kicked in on that yeah. last uh, point. We should say at that point, Kevin, that's because we were, we'd done 21 miles on zero percent state of charge you know it was yeah. that that car was 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 giving something none of us knew it could give so which was interesting as well well i just feel like the listeners have got to this stage in this podcast and you haven't even told them what did you achieve what was the precise figures come on hit us with the stats uh, well, I think it was 569.7 miles. It was. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which be 1.7 miles beyond the previous record. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was tight. Yeah. And, um, you know, the vehicle didn't break down either, by the way. Um, it was still driving. Uh, we still could have carried on, um, theoretically, though we don't know whether we would have got another yard or another mile. It's hard to tell. Um, but the vehicle did not break down. Um, so we had it obviously safely taken away and back to the, back to the charging point um, to replenish its energies. But it didn't actually stop, um, which is you know quite phenomenal after all that time, all that driving. Um, you know, ignition was on the entire time, uh, and it didn't skip a beat. So um, it's a yeah, pretty impressive bit of kit. What's the car meant to be capable of? Um, Three hundred and seventy-two is WLTP. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And I guess that's the point. This isn't something that we're expecting. What I call normal drivers like me <laughs> to go and achieve, but it does just go to show, demonstrate with figures measured figures, verified figures, that these vehicles are capable of so much more than we think if we optimise the asset that we've, that we've got. You know, the whole point of having Webfleet Invoid is the planning, integrating that state of charge data, predicting real, based on the route uh, range prediction. There was this wonderful moment in the video where you seemed pretty sure, you seemed like it was going really well, you were completely on the curve of what was to be hoped for. And then all these real life things happen. And that's what happens to fleet managers everywhere. Now, now Sam, I interrupted you, you're going to go back to something about that sort of mental state share. What was it? Oh, I can't remember now. Um, but what I think was more important, actually, now, uh, now we've moved on a little bit is um, the point you made about the fact, and, and Richard said this earlier, you know, we're not all going to be Guinness World Record holders. You know, we push those variables to the absolute limit in every way, physically, mentally, technologically. But that doesn't mean that we can all not, it means we can all do a little bit of that. Mm. We're not all going to be Guinness World Record holders, but if everyone just drives a little bit more efficiency, more efficient mm. as a result of learnings that we've created and demonstrated here, then generally EVs will travel further. You'll get more, more efficiency, lower your cost. Um, so, 
it, it, what we've achieved is applicable to everybody that drives an EV everywhere. It doesn't mean you're going to get 200 miles more than the standard uh, figures, but it does mean that you'll get a little bit further. Even if it's 20 or 30 miles, you'll take it, right? So everyone can do that, everybody that drives an EV. And we just want to you know, use this as a platform to prove the art of the possible, but also be able to give people the encouragement to do it themselves in a, in a small way. I think what I've learned from you is that um, uh, what I've learned from you, particularly watching this unfold, is that little bit of difference, take that 17% of the van that will not be named, um, it, it's the difference of getting home or not. Now, I don't have a home charger. A lot of fleet drivers out there don't have home chargers. So knowing that you're driving efficiently, which means you'll get safely back to wherever your designated charge is due to be, it's a real, real comfort, I think. And that's something um, that we should really talk about is we were... It, very supported. You guys were very, very supported. This is a collaborative effort. You had the AA there the whole time. Um, what were their, What was their role in this? Um, I think mainly for that is to support us if something went wrong, if we had a puncture. But for most of the time, they were only really required for that very end to rescue us mm. when we ran out because actually the cars can go much further than people anticipate. Actually, they did it at the beginning. If you, you probably won't remember because you were tired and getting prepared. But actually, the guys from the AA were crucial in preparing the tyres for the trip, so the inflation and making sure, because like to Sam's point, we talked, we put really specific A-rated tyres from Bridgestone on on those on that vehicle, uh, you know, that has been designed for EV running, you know, so they were really specifically designed for it. But, but having them at the right pressure, as you know, again, as anyone running a fleet knows, tyres at the wrong pressure lead to inefficiency of driving. So they did a lot of prep work yeah. for us, actually, to make sure the yeah. vehicle was in tip-top ready for the trip, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. then to verify, to be those independent yeah. verification to make yeah. sure that we haven't fiddled with the car, to make sure they sealed the, fuel, the charge flap. It was there for that independent verification to show that we hadn't, added extra battery just to just add to the web fleet data to prove that we hadn't done anything untoward. Mm. Yes, I remember there's a great bit where the, the flap gets sealed with um, tape and then it's it's signed. And this, these are these are the inside bits that people just say, oh, well done, you got a record. Great, what was it? Fantastic statistics, fab. Nobody knows the effort that goes in with all of these extra bits behind. What I loved about it was that when the peril was really setting in and we were all sat there, all of us who couldn't be there with you because, of course, it's a limited number that can take part in it in person, we were just watching the chat unfold. Update, please. Update, please. We were looking on forums what to expect, what's going to happen. And then I, the, I never saw this coming. AA look after their staff extremely carefully and they got to the limit of their permitted sort of time at the wheel. And this was happening at the exact same time that all of us thought that the thing was going to end and needed to be rescued. So we just didn't know what was going to happen. But of course, they worked it out. And that's the, that's the point I was trying to make is when people listen to this and they think, that's not me, I can't drive like that. I don't want to drive like that. It doesn't matter. If you if you look after your vehicle and try to eke out that extra percentage by just changing a smooth, a few, smooth driving, a few small incremental changes that add up to a big difference. And you know what? If it all goes wrong, the AA are always, always there. Now, I feel like, you know, because today's a big day for you, you're going to be getting your certificates unveiled. I've already seen, I don't know who's going to take this one. This is the one that I get to look at behind me. Very exciting. Where will you put them, guys? What are you going to do with them when you get your certificates? Oh, I've just decorated my lounge, so I'm toilet. guessing it's going, it can go toilet. on a fresh wall, can't it, in public view? <laughs> I'm going to do what Sam does. Sam's making sure he's behind in every camera shot, doesn't it, from the van one, so... Why not? You know, it's it's not everyone gets to have that certificate in the house, do they? So, you know, you've got to make the most of it. Yeah, I absolutely uh, hang, have hung mine in pride of place uh, because I'm incredibly proud of what we've achieved. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully this isn't the end either. You know, I want to keep doing this um, mm. because the, the reach has been unbelievable. You know, the, the, we've, we've, we've highlighted this challenge and this achievement globally um, across millions and millions of people, um, and that's um, that's just incredible. Mm. So the more we can do that, you know, the more we can, as we all wish to do, um, accelerate the uptake of EVs. You know, and yeah. this is this is one little way of just showing what the art of the possible really is. What about you, Kevin? Um, well, this is going to sound really bad, but I'm running out with space. <laughs> oh, oh so, all right, yeah, okay. I'll just keep this one, and I'll have this. So, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I've got to move some things around on the wall to pitch <laughs> number five in with the others. 
okay, okay, all right. No. But thinking How about what friends. you've learned. <laughs> <laughs> Your individual record holders now, you can all say that, all three of you. And, and Kevin, continue to make sure that you say that you've got a five because that means that Sam's two. It just urges him to get even more, right? back in his box, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> But what I really want to know and what, what I love this privileged position of being able to quiz you about it is what, now that you're record holders, what would you recommend to businesses? Bear in mind, a lot of the people that listen to the EV Cafe is, is a business audience. So I'm hoping that people are really genuinely inspired. If I could go to you one by one and you give us your top tip for businesses transitioning to electric vehicles with the record in mind. Who wants to start? I start then. Do the groundwork, plan. You said it, plan, plan, plan. This only happened because of months, not just weeks, it was months of bringing it together and trying to understand like where are the obstacles that we may encounter and planning to overcome them so that on the day when those things happened, actually it wasn't panic and you reacted to get to the end. So don't underestimate the power of spending some time to plan what you're about to do. Um, yeah, that's good. I think I would add that to say that, you know, in front of this camera now, we've got decades worth of driving experience between us, right? Mm. So often on fleets, you get thrown a set of keys, off you go, you know, here's your electric mm. van, you know, go, go and enjoy that. Mm. Um, what needs to happen is people need to try these vehicles first, understand them, get behind the wheel. Um, so I, I, as well as the planning, mm. get the experience. See, if it doesn't matter mm. what it is, it could be a Renault Zoe or a mm. or a e-sprinter you know try something electric before you go out into the real world and then you get a feel for what's coming um it's really important for people to understand mm. you know just the basic fundamentals of, of how how driving an ev can be very enjoyable very smooth mm. very effective very pleasant and do all of that in advance by just getting behind the wheel is what i would say and for me i think one of the important things is driver training none of these evs are particularly slow and actually by training people how to drive them sensibly you get more range, you have less wear on your fleet, and it's just getting people trained up on how to use them. As Sam said, don't just hand people the keys, go out with them, show them how it works. Mm. And like that, and using data, I guess, to remove that guesswork, working with the people who are going to be driving these vehicles and, and helping them to understand that realistic sort of capability of the vehicle. We don't want anyone being disappointed. And working with sort of experts alongside can help track that success and actually Richard again coming back to the podcast I listened to you with you, you and James Dewhurst there was a really nice point in there that I enjoyed about stakeholder engagement it's not not enough sort of what I th I'm sure you said or James said middle management need to experience this too not just up and down the chain so how how would Webfleet support a business going through this transition to make sure that every element of that stakeholder chain has a chance to understand uh, well, I guess one of the sort of commitments is that, and as you know, I've started a new role as a specific EV consultant for Webfleet. So we are absolutely separating the typical kind of sales roles and creating a specific skill set that when you're with your customers, not only are you doing the sort of the data and the vehicle stuff, but you can engage with the management teams and explain how you can make it successful. And it, going back, this was SJ. You know, it came from the decarb lounge that we did and originally – and, and she said, like, everyone focuses on the driver and forgets the people who are touching the drivers day to day with their depot management and things like that. And she made a real key um, objective of engaging with them to get their buy-in and, and their knowledge up. So to Sam's point, she did as much training with the managers as she did with the drivers who had got the right foot on, on, you know, on the, in the vehicle. Um, and then how do we support that? Well, it's the specific tools of making sure that the distribution of the insights that come in particular drivers is fed back rightly through the, those middle managers. I mean, at the end of the day, their job isn't to be a fleet manager, isn't to look at the performance, but they have an accountability for how that vehicle performs. And to something you said a little bit earlier about the driver getting home and that range, actually, in the example of this customer, it was actually the, uh, our customer. It was their customer's experience so vehicles failing reflects on their customer experience and therefore the reputation of their business. And so that's why they made the real effort because they have, they're a consumer type business. And so they didn't want their customers leaving them because of unreliability. You know, so it's, it's right the way through the organization that in the right insights delivered from a high level sort of stakeholder overarching um, piece down through the middle management and then direct to the driver 
to help them in the moment understand what actions they've done and the consequences of those actions. The complexity, the layers and layers of data, the, the numeracy required to understand it. So this is about enabling businesses to understand that data, to digest it, track energy consumption, understand when maintenance is required proactively, I presume, uh, route optimization, and then just having that smooth running fleet to, in my world, improve the bottom line, but also just making sure those drivers don't want to give the keys back. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, this, this customer who's had that experience of range increase, they, they run a number of depots and they have relief drivers come from other depots. And actually, they've reached a point where drivers coming in re to from depots that aren't yet running um, electric vehicles are requesting to have the electric vehicle. So the whole view of that vehicle as a place of work is is regarded in re really highly by them. Um, but they've invested a lot of time in the people and our data, using our data to get to the right information, but, but really focusing on the, the people that run those businesses to make it work. Uh, I, lo I love it. We're, we're, we're very privileged on the EV Cafe. We get invited to some really cool stuff, vehicle launches, shows, and it's really our duty. It's our collective responsibility to disseminate information and share it more widely. So you're here today on this podcast. That's fantastic. What's next for you spreading the word about the advantages of these records versus real world experience? Where, where will we get to see you next? Well, I think um, keeping to, uh, using uh, forum, forums like this to disseminate this information and keep doing it is important. So we need to Make sure these these achievements that we've all done as a team, you know, are still spread far and wide to show what the art of the possible is, um, and then keep challenging ourselves. You know, we need to do more. Let's let's do more challenges. Let's let's prove more things out, um, because you know we are privileged, all of us in this in this forum, the EV Cafe and Webfleet and Bridgestone and and Kev and me and everybody else. We were all in a position whereby we can we can do these things. We can showcase what the art of the possible is because we're experienced EV drivers and we just got to get that information out there. And if that means we do fun things like Guinness World Records to prove that point, then so be it because we're having a great time, but it's also got a really, really fundamental mm -hmm. learning and educational aspect to it, um, which everyone that drives an EV can benefit from. And I think that's really valuable. I do too. And what a team. You guys are such a team. I just, I'm right behind you. I really hope that we do so many more of these uh, records with us as the support crew, Webfleet verifying everything, and probably you too, battling it out between you who's going to be the most efficient driver. What a painful experience that well, is. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be good. I mean, you know, it's really only about that much. much. I, I, I know the figures on that one, but I'll keep oh. quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, it wouldn't be right. Um, these podcasts are often hosted by myself, Paul Kirby or John Curtis. And there is a little tradition that we do, which is to ask each of you as guests, what would be your magic wand moment to improve our industry in the next three, maybe five years? It's a tough question. I've just sprung it on you. Richard, I know yours was asking the government a very hard question. Would you repeat it for us? Uh, it was simply, can you be consistent? Um, and can you remove politics? from the environmental need of what we're trying to do here with changing vehicles to be uh, like far more environmentally friendly. And Sam, you've got 20 years of experience now with this. If, do you have a silver bullet in mind? Um, I think if I had a magic one moment, Sass, it would be to hold people to account on providing disinformation into the marketplace mm. because there is so much of it um, that 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 just is trickery of, of headlines that just give the wrong image and are factually incorrect. And that's doing the um, economy, it's doing the environment, no favours whatsoever. Uh, it might be helping the oil companies and certain OEMs sell more combustion engine cars, but it's not helping the wider planet. So disinformation or misinformation, um, I would love to be able to hold people more to account when they factually get things wrong or better still prevent them from being able to say these things in the first place. You know, beware fibbers and naysayers, Mr. Clark is after you. And how about you, Kim? Um, I think I'd just like to get rid of the, the polarisation in industry. It shouldn't need to be EVs versus ICE. We should all be able to get along. And actually, we know the direction of travel is to EV. It's, and it's not there to control. Just that sort of balance to say to people, you know, it's not a fight against making you do stuff. It's like it's just because of the environment, we're all doing it and we're all in it together. Yeah, doing the right thing for what is ultimately boiling down to clean air. You can argue the toss about the science everywhere you go, but it's the clean air that kills at the end of it all. 
So making sure that we're progressing towards that zero emission future that we all hope for is exactly why we started this podcast. I listen to a lot, I consume a lot of podcasts. There are some great shows out there. We have done many, many an episode with a CEO, a leader, or just somebody who's got a bloody good idea that we want to pull apart and make it easy to understand. And that's what we do on the EV Cafe. So from me, a huge thank you to you three for being here today. Please do like, share and subscribe. And we release one of these every single week. So dig in, share with your colleagues and friends. And I think this one is one for everyone. So it's bye from me and it's bye from them. See you next time on the EV Cafe podcast. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks.